right, let's start. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Excellent. My name is uh, Jakob Freund. I'm co-founder CEO of Camunda. I'm happy to welcome you to this Camunda BPM 7.4 webinar. And I would like to start right away by sharing my desktop, therefore also sharing my slide deck. Okay. Just a second. Chup. All right. Okay. So we're good to go. Cool. Excellent. So I'm not alone here, really. Um, with me is uh, Daniel, Daniel Meyer. Daniel is um, the lead of the Commander BPM uh, technical project. Daniel, could you please say hello? Hello. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> could have done it better, really. <laughs> okay. And also here is, um, for the first time for release webinar um, for Commander BPM, Nico, Nico Riewald. He is the technical lead for the BPMN.io project. Nico, how can you do? I'm doing awesome. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Right. So, um, yes, we're quite excited to present uh, the newest version of the Camona BPM platform to you. And um, before we start, um, just a few logistical aspects. So the slides that I'm going to present now um, will be published on SlideShare very soon. So you will get um, a follow-up email that uh, will contain the link to the slide deck, as well as the link to uh, the recording that will be published on, on Vimeo. And if you have any questions uh, right now about what we're going to tell and to show, um, please don't hesitate to um, uh, to, to just enter them in the chat window on the left-hand side. So um, Daniel and Nico will be observing that, that window and may uh, be able to answer them right away um, while I'm, I'm presenting. Or um, if they are uh, about less technical questions, then I'm happy to answer them at the end of this webinar. Um, the end, um, speaking of, will be in about 60 minutes. Okay, cool. So um, for all of you who are not yet too familiar with Camona BPM, just a very small definition um, in a nutshell. So Camona BPM is uh, an open source platform for business process management, and it's all about modeling and execution of um, BPMN 2.0 diagrams, CMN case um, models, and DMN decision tables. And uh, BPMN has been with us from, yeah, from the very beginning of, of Camona BPM. CMMN is a standard that we have implemented last year, which is about, yeah, as I said, case management rather than structured workflow management. And DMN is, uh, so, to, so to say, the new kit on the block that we have actually implemented as part of uh, the release that, that we are presenting right now. Um, we are, as you probably recognize from, from my accent already, um, based out of Berlin in Germany. Um, so most of our customers, of course, come from the German-speaking area, mostly from the insurance industry, the finance industry, logistics, um, telco, and e-commerce industry. Um, since a good number of you um, will probably be attending from the United States, it could be interesting to know that we also have, of course, customers in the U.S. The most recent one that we have signed up is at and but there's also the Financial Regulatory Authority, FINRA, there's uh, Sony DIDC in, in California, Spotter Systems, a software vendor from New Jersey. So um, we are actually, um, yeah, being used all over the globe, basically. Okay, so, yeah, that's about Camunder um, itself. So let's look at, at the news release 7.4. And as um, some of you may know already, we um, release in six-month cycles. So um, the last release has been in May. And then we have been um, working six months on 7.4. Uh, we now have about 14 core developers um, yeah, working directly on, on Camunda BPM. Um, we have more than 40 contributors, um, so people helping us. Since it's open source, that's, that's quite common, really. And we're using a um, ticketing system called, called Jira that some of you probably know. So um, alone in, in, in Jira, it's more than 600 tickets that we have closed in the last six months. So mostly feature requests, requests requirements, of course, also a few bucks. Um, and this does not even in, involve or um, consider all those tickets that uh, Nico and his team have, have closed in bpmn.io since they use Waffle.io, which is a d different ticket system. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, there, there's quite some effort um, that, that we have put in, in Camunda 7.4, and uh, which are the highlights, really, that we are going to present now. The very first one is a totally new Camunda modeler. So some of you may know the, um, the BPMN plugin for Eclipse, um, but this year is a completely different tool, really, and we're very, very excited about it. Um, next, we're going to talk about yeah, DMN, obviously, so the Decision Model and Notation Standard. Um, so those two are actually there 
you could say, the main clusters or the main highlights of, of the newest release. Um, we have yet again improved the so-called job executor that um, I will discuss with, with Daniel in a few minutes. Um, and we have yet again improved uh, our support for the BPMN standard as well as the CMMN standard. And, yeah, and even more stuff. So it's, it's really quite a lot, actually. So we're trying to prioritize here to, um, to, to bring the most exciting highlights in a nutshell. Okay. So let's start with, with the modeler right away. Um, as I said, it's a completely new tool. So it's um, actually a desktop application that you can download, that you can run on, on Windows or Mac OS or Linux, and you can use it for creating and editing BPMN diagrams as well as DMN tables. So that may not sound totally new if, if you're already used to, for instance, the Eclipse plugin, but um, part of what's really new about it is that it's very, very easy to use. So it's a tool that really targets both groups, business developers as well as, uh, sorry, business analysts as well as software developers. And it's actually based on uh, bpmn.io. So some of you may know bpmn.io already. You can just point your browser to, to this um, URL and you can just try it out right away and you will be impressed probably by the usability of the bpmn editor that actually runs in your browser. So technically we have um, taken something that, that runs in your browser and uh, put it in a desktop application that you can download um, at kamunda.org. So yeah, you may wonder, and it's actually a, a good question, why we have done that. So that's the first question that I would like to, to ask Nico. So uh, why did we actually yeah, put a web-based modeler in a desktop application? Thanks for asking, Jacob. Um, so there's actually, like, basically two, two of the most important reasons is, reasons is there is a it takes a lot of effort to build a good modeling tool, and we spent some effort like building BPMN.io and making it as streamlined as possible. And uh, people probably also, like, they will recognize that when they try to use it. So, the, so actually, the, the, the first uh, important step, or the one important idea of BPMN.io is actually bringing it to any platform. And that also includes, obviously, not only running on the web, because there are, there's, feature, there's, there's people that are working on trains, for instance, in Germany on trains, you probably never ever get internet on a train. So you actually also want to model your BPMN diagrams when you're offline. So that still happens uh, to people at times. So um, obviously you can also build offline ready web applications, but it's always like in our point of view, it's also good if developers especially get tools that are available on their computers. That also means the tool needs to integrate natively into their operating system which means double click for Windows and Mac users and um, different kind of things. And it, it also means obviously that, um, that that's something only an application can provide. But still we have the application on the one side and then we have a web-based modeling tool on the other side and they both they share the same usability, which is something that is really important for us. Yeah. Great, thank you, Nico. And um, yeah, I will I will just demo it right away because um, that's actually the best way to 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 present this this new tool here. So um, let me quickly uh, look how I can do that. So um, as as Nico already mentioned, we wanted to provide um, the best possible usability for business users as well as developers. So this means that when we're looking at the model and the context of the Camunda BPM platform, that we're really um, using it to edit BPMN files that just um, yeah, that are just stored on, on our local um, file system in order to be deployed um, as part of a process application. So what I'm going to do now is I will show you where you can actually download the new modeler. Um, then I'm just telling you that you can, um, once you've downloaded it, just unzip it, just start it up. It will offer you to associate um, your BPMN .bpmn files um, on your computer um, with this tool so that you can actually open those files with a double click. And then you can just create a simple BPMN diagram right away, add some technical properties, save it in, for instance, an existing Camunda project in your workspace and deploy and run it. So let me quickly do that here, um, at least partly for now. So I will switch to my browser, okay? And when I'm uh, visiting the kamunda.org website, there's um, the well-known download button. So I can just um, go here, switch to the modeler tab, and then I can just pick um, the operating system that I'm running and download the respective version of, of the modeler. So I've already done that. Um, it's, it's pretty quick, really. And now I can just um, open the tool. That's what I'm going to do right now. 
There we go. So this is um, the, the new Kamunda modeler. And what I can do right now is I can just create a new BPMN diagram. So as you can see here, it's the very same user experience that you also have in bpmn.io. So I can create my, my BPMN diagrams very, very quickly. Um, let's look at the properties panel later. And um, yeah, I can just build it up. Maybe I want to wanna change something. So maybe I've forgotten something. I can just squeeze it here in between. So let's say I want to add another task. And maybe I want to bring this back together. Okay, there we go. Um, let's put a pool around it. And while we're at it, let's define there's two lanes, really. Um, let's say this is actually a collaboration diagram. So I can just start another pool. And I can say, okay, those two should actually interact. Little lip. Well, okay, you get the point. So um, long story short, our, our ambition was to create um, the best possible user experience for, for modeling BPMN diagrams. And I think um, Nico and his team have actually achieved that. So um, we're very proud of that. And as I said, this is a tool that um, business users can, can use, but also developers actually want to make those BPMN diagrams ex executable. So what I can do here is I can say, for instance, okay, this should be a user task, and a user task in the world of Kamundo has certain properties, of course. So, for instance, the name of the assignee, which could also be an expression, of course, stuff like that. Um, so I won't go through all the properties here, but basically I can do in here what I can also do with um, the, um, the traditional Eclipse plugin. So um, once I'm done, I can just um, save this diagram on my hard disk um, in my project folder and, and use it for execution. I will actually do that later. I won't do it right now because I don't want to lose too much time um, for this slot, but we will look at the modeler again when we are discussing uh, the DMN support in Camunda BPN. Okay. So one, one more thing about uh, bpmn.io. Um, so bpmn.io is, um, as I said, the open source project that is, you could say, the technical foundation for the new Camunda modeler. So it's um, the project that, um, that Nico is taking care of. And um, obviously, it's not only about providing a desktop application. So for instance, if you are a um, web developer yourself and you want to embed bpmn.io, for instance, for um, displaying bpmn diagrams or DMN tables or for editing them, you can actually do that. And um, one thing that, that you may wonder is, um, okay, how can I actually get started with BPMNIO? So I'm a developer myself. I want to get started. Um, now I have um, the chance of a lifetime to ask Nico how I can actually do that. Nico, what is your answer? So, um, yeah, the answer is basically following uh, any of the links which are on the current slide. No, just, uh, just joking. This um, BPMNIO, the first step for you probably just go on the website and make yourself familiar with the project, like what we have, depending on what you want to do. If you're not a web developer, we still have something like a seed project. You can quickly download, just try it out. Um, we have a bundled version, which is basically the like jQuery. Simply grab it. There is this, this bpmni.io slash getting started that will, based on your development, on your requirements, and based on what you can actually do, it should give you a quick access to uh, bpmni.io. Um, behind the scene, there's a lot of modern web technologies. So depending on how deep you want to get, you would also need to get familiar with like a lot of that stuff. Um, but for the beginning, we have a quite like we tried to make it a, a easy getting started. We have a forum where you can ask questions about it. We have a lot of examples based on the BPMN uh, IO GitHub organization. There's the BPMN JS examples, which shows you BPM like the the toolkit that basically allows you to embeds and also model BPMN in different use cases. There's some, some really simple use cases, like how to use it in a standalone version. There's more, more complicated use cases, like building a, uh, integrating a properties panel, building a URL viewer. And there's uh, really, really like uh, advanced use cases, like for instance, building your custom modeler with it, like having BPMN and your custom whatever modeling symbols next to it. So there's uh, a lot of examples for all the use cases which are out there. If there is an example with uh, missing, um, approach us on the forums and we are going to work on this. Um, in the near future, there will also be um, better documentation on certain APIs. Um, at the moment, there is uh, some documentation and the rest of the documentation is hidden in the source code. Cool, thank you very much, Nico.
So it's really the motto. I think uh, the motto of the project is PPM and everywhere, and that's what you're actually working on. So yeah, very excited about that as well, of course. Okay, so let's um, let's move forward. Um, the next part, the next chapter of this webinar is uh, the DMN, the Decision Model and Notation Standard. So let me very quickly um, introduce DMN and explain in a nutshell what it's all about. Um, you probably know that the BPMN standard, the well-established, um, is from a group called Object Management Group, OMG. The very same institution is also responsible for CMMN and also for DMN. So it is the real standard, and it's a standard that is about modeling and executing decisions. So um, if you think that smells of business rules management, you're correct. Um, if you want to get um, yeah, kind of a crash course, um, just point your browser to this uh, URL here, community.org slash dmn slash tutorial, so um, there you can find a tutorial, obviously. And um, yeah, since I've written that myself, and I don't know if you know that, that book um, called Real Life BPMN that I have written together with my co-founder, Ben Drücker, um, most examples in there are about um, food and eating, so it's kind of a hobby, I have to admit. And so, so that's why um, the examples in um, this DMN tutorial are also about food. So let's have a look at this here on the right-hand side, because I will use it for my live demo, too. Um, very simple explanation about how a DMN decision table looks like. Um, here in the upper left corner, we have the name of the decision, also the technical name. We have the so-called HIT policy, so the U for in this example stands for unique, which means that only one of the following rules may apply in, in, in one decision um, execution. Uh, could be also different HIT policies, of course. Um, we are, here we have uh, two so-called input columns, so this means that any decision will be um, yeah, executed based on certain input data. In this case, it's about the season of the year that we actually have, because we want to um, make up our mind whether we want to um, cook, for instance, spare ribs or roast beef or other tasty things that, that I really fancy. Um, so um, in this example, a season is, is a string, and um, the input expression, the so-called, um, in this case just means that we will actually look up a variable that is called season and that is of type string. This could actually be way more um, yeah, powerful or sophisticated. So Kamuna would also allow you to actually evaluate expression languages um, um, or also script languages languages in here, so you can already do a lot. But for the sake of simplicity in this example, I'm just using a simple a primitive string variable. The same is true for um, the number of guests that we are expecting. So um, this is of type integer. And based on those two um, um, inputs, we will determine which dish we actually want to prepare. So this could be um, spirits, roast beef, etc. Um, again, there could be more than actually one output um, output um, um, entries. So um, this is just a very simple example, really. Um, but let, let's look at, at at one example here. So for instance, um, if it's winter and we're expecting up to eight guests, we will serve roast beef. Okay. Um, if it is winter and we expect more than eight guests, then we actually want to have less effort per guest and maybe also a bit less expensive or uh, more cost-effective kind of meals, so this could be stew. Okay, so this is in a very yeah, simple way how um, a DMN decision table works. Um, just mentioning um, those expressions that you can find here, like, uh, for instance, the interval of 5 to 8, this is actually a syntax called um, FEEL. FEEL stands for Friendly Enough Expression Language, and is also part of the DMN standard. So Commander has, of course, also implemented that. Yeah. Much more to talk about, but um, let's let's give it a try and really um, see how this how this works. And what I'm going to do now is I will um, show you how you can actually um, edit decision tables in the Kamunda modeler. I will show you how you can actually um, execute them and stand alone as well as part of a BPMN process. You could also execute them as part of a CMN case, but this would actually be too much for, for this webinar time-wise. Um, we can actually track executed decisions so we can see what actually happened. Um, and we can also, we call it live editing, so change decision tables on the fly while they are already in production. And this is actually the first feature in this webinar that um, is not available for our open source edition users, um, but only for the enterprise edition customers of Kamunda BPM. Okay. Yeah, so my demo, I will, um, in the first one, show you how a Java developer can use that very lightweight decision engine that we have implemented just as part of a, of a JUnit test using the Java API. Then, based on that, we will look at um, how we can actually evaluate decisions using the REST API, so this becomes obviously more language agnostic. And then, again, we will be 
technically um, based on that looking at the web interfaces that Camunda provides out of the box, like Tasklist and Cockpit, and get an idea about how they interact with the DMN decision engine. Okay, let's do it. So I'm very excited myself now and anxious since this is a real life demo and I have dangerous half knowledge about technical details. But I should be able to do that. So um, what you can see here is um, the good old Eclipse with a JUnit test inside. And um, what I have done here is um, I have said, okay, and let me quickly walk you through it. If you're a Java developer, you will appreciate that. And if not, you will hopefully uh, um, endure the pain. Okay, so um, we have we have here a um, very variable called um, season. So um, in this case, um, it's summer, and um, we are expecting up to 14, or we're expecting 14 guests, really. So now we just get the, the, the DMN engine. Um, we actually load the DMN file, um, which is just stored on my local disk right now. Um, we parse it for, um, for evaluating the decision later on. We um, put our, our input variables into a variable map, and this will be handed over to the DMN engine. So this is actually the magic moment where we determine, based on the variables, um, the result, and this result will then be just printed out. So it's not a real unit test. There's no assertions or whatever. It's just for the sake of, of um, demonstrating this. So let's do it. Um, it's summer, we expect 14 guests, and I just won this test. So, did a little lip. Okay, so let's, um, let's prepare a light salad and a nice steak, because I can't do without. Um, let's look at the decision table and, and change it. So, um, as I said, it's here on my hard disk, so I can just open it in the Camunda modeler, which is, um, as I said, DMN compliant as well. And let's say um, for, for summer, um, well, let's, let's actually add another rule. So let's say, um, okay, let's assume it's summer. Ah, we're going to 2M. And um, if it's up to four guests, there will be the salad thing. But if it's more than four guests, we will serve, I don't know, I don't want to type in crowd because as a German, that will be discriminating for me. But let's say um, hamburger, okay. Sorry, make fun of myself. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so let's say um, um, we go for hamburgers. Um, okay, so let's run this. It's summer, more than five guests, and we're expecting hamburgers. Let's try it out. There we go. Um, okay, let's um, try something else. Let's say, um, yeah, the salad thing was for up to four guests, so let's try the up to four guests version, and there should be light salad. There we go. Okay, so that's how easy you can actually use the DMN engine as, as a Java developer. So let's, um, let's move forward. Let's deploy this decision now, um, or decision table, and um, use it using the REST API. So what I'm going to do now is I will hit my little on task here in order to deploy it. Okay, so let's check whether that worked as expected. Um, here is the cockpit. Okay, let's log in again. My session expired. There we go. So, um, in this cockpit now, which is also, of course, new with the 7.4, so um, there's a new section in here, which is about decisions, obviously. So we can see that there's currently two decision tables deployed. One is about our invoice example, which is not interesting right now, and the other one is the dish decision table. So let's look at that. And this is, of course, the version that I've just um, changed um, with the Camunda modeler. So here we have our hamburger um, um, rule as well. So this is obviously deployed now. But um, so far, there haven't been any decision instances um, being executed because my test one was obviously my local Eclipse. Um, so let's try this now using the REST API. So I will um, start my little advanced REST client. Here we go. And um, yeah, the REST API obviously has um, a few new, few new methods um, that I can call. So this one here is about a method called decision definition. Um, I will determine um, that definition based on the key. So I've just called my table decision and I want to evaluate it. Um, so this is a post request. Um, I'm supposed to hand over my variables um, as JSON, um, for instance, and I'm just doing that here, obviously. So I'm Ah, I want to cook for 150 guests in summer, so I'm expecting hamburgers now. 
There we go. It's about hamburgers. So um, let's change the season for change. Let's say we are in winter and it's not so bad. So let's say it's it's just two guests, really. Okay, roast beef. Great. So um, now I can also use a, a nice DMN um, decision engine, even if I'm not a Java developer, but a JavaScript developer or .NET developer or whatever kind of developer. Okay, um, let's move forward. Um, let's have a look at um, how that decision um, will be evaluated out of a PPMN process. So I have created that very simple um, dish preparation process here. There we go. And um, so it's just about a business rule task um, that determines the dish. And based on that result, um, there's a user task with a simple form that displays the kind of dish that I want to prepare or that I'm supposed to prepare. So um, let's run this process. Okay, there's some invoice task that I'm not interested in. Um, here's my dish process. So let's say for change, it's, it's spring and we're expecting three guests. There we go. So we have our user task now. So I'm now the end user, obviously. And I'm supposed to prepare a dry, oh, I like that, a dry aged gourmet steak. That's actually my favorite rule. Um, but because it's so expensive, um, um, it will only be recommended for up to four guests, I suppose. Okay, so what has happened? We have this, um, this process instance now that is currently pending in this prepare dish um, user task because um, the business rule task has already been executed, obviously. So um, when looking at the history now, we can see, did it dip? let me quickly look that up. Um, no, sorry, I wanted to go to the, yeah, exactly. So we can see now, okay, this is my current process instance. It's currently pending here. It has obviously executed this uh, business rule task already. So what has happened as part of the process instance, we have called the decision engine. So we can just jump over there and we can see, okay, in this one, um, we have um, obviously evaluated um, a decision to the result of um, yeah, the dry aged gourmet steak. So we can actually see which decision has been made and also why, so which rule has applied. Okay, so this is about decision tracking. Great. Um, so let's do one last thing in here. Let's change this decision table on the fly. So let's say, okay, um, I'm, I'm in, let's say, in production right now. So um, let's assume, should we, should we go for summer once again? Yeah, why not? So it's summer. But um, let's say the, the burger thing is only good for, I don't know, five to seven guests. And um, if it's more than seven guests, then <laughs> let's do the German thing and serve potatoes. Everyone loves potatoes. Okay. Um, yeah, that should be good. Okay, so now it's telling me I'm playing with fire because I'm obviously changing a decision table that is, um, yeah, um, theoretically in production. So I deploy this. There we go. And when I'm, I'm looking at the table again, I can see, okay, here's my newest version of the table. So when I run the very same process again, let's try it out. The dish process, it's summer and it's more than seven, I think. So let's say, I don't know, 10. Okay. There we go. And now it's all about potatoes. Okay. So um, obviously, um, um, we, can, we can do a lot by, by combining BPMN and DMN. Um, what I haven't shown right now, and maybe I can just do that, is that, of course, I can also um, route the process based on the result of my um, decision evaluation. So what I can do is, um, let me just quickly do that. So let's look at the process once again. Oh, no, this is my other example. So let's look at the dish preparation process. Here it is. So let's say, okay, um, what did I say? Now let's say, okay, oh, pardon me. Ah, okay, there we go. Um, okay, based on um, the result, so let's assume it's all about roast beef. Roast beef, hippie. Okay. Mm. So the SND is my demo user once again. So what I'm currently doing is I'm saying, uh, okay, if the result of my decision table 
which is a variable called um, desired dish has um, the value roast beef. I want to road throughout the process um, down there. Okay. And if it's not, so if it's not roast beef, I will take the, the normal um, route. Oop. There we go. Okay. So um, why am I actually looking at a variable called desired dish? Because that is the variable that comes back from my um, decision table, as I have specified in my business rule task properties. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's try it out. So I will go back to my Eclipse, deploy the thing once again. Okay. So let's look at cockpit, whether we have that new version of the process already. Okay. There we go. So let's try it out. Start a new version. Oh. I need to remember under which circumstances I'm actually serving roast beef. So <laughs> let's look it up. Um, the roast beef is in winter um, for up to eight guests. Okay, I can I can do that. <laughs> I can memorize that hopefully. So um, let's say it is winter and we're expecting six guests. It's all about roast beef. Okay. So, yeah, um, I think that, that should be it for now. So I just wanted to, yeah, show kind of the tip of the iceberg of what you can do um, by combining um, DMN with BPMN. So um, that should be okay for now. Um, let me switch back to my slide deck. But, um, yeah, as you probably um, um, see already, it's actually a lot of fun to, to, to play with that. And I think you can do a lot with, with the DMN stuff that we have implemented. I mean, we, we did that for a reason, of course. So some of you may notice that we had that um, huge survey about business rule automation in the beginning of 2015. So there were about 600 people participating in that. And um, more than half of them said that they are not satisfied with their existing business rule automation um, technology that they, that they were using. And I think part of that is because um, they're quite um, yeah, complicated, not so easy to use um, for developers, as well as not so easy to use for business users um, in terms of, for instance, um, yeah, editing decision tables, etc. So that's why we, why we did that. And we're already getting a lot of positive response for that. Okay. Um, if you want to learn more about what we've done, um, you can look it up. So it's all on the web. Um, the whole engine is documented. Um, so, for instance, how to do unit testing, etc. Um, you can find in the very first link here. Um, you can look at the REST um, API um, in order to use the DMN engine via REST, as I've just demonstrated. Um, and the cockpit behavior is, is um, documented. Um, there's a reference guide that also explains, for instance, um, the feel expression language. And that's also a very nice, very lean and, and, and um, yeah, lean example um, about how to just you know, bootstrap the DMN engine in a Java um, static void main method. So that's, that's very straightforward, I think. Okay. Cool. So, um, Daniel, um, you, you could rest um, until now, but now it's all about the job executor. Um, this is a very um, important yet sophisticated um, um, matter. So could you please explain in a nutshell for all of us what the job executor is all about, why we need it, and why it's so important? Yeah, well, we, we were busy here answering as much as uh, of the questions that, that came in as possible. Um, yes, the job executor, um, it's about, um, well, processing triggers. So let's just look at the um, example process that we have here. And um, it, it has a start event, um, which um, kicks off the process. And then there is a first user task um, with a timer attached, meaning that the task is canceled when um, after two hours. So if the user doesn't complete it, it's canceled after two hours. Um, then there is a service task, um, which has this um, um, annotation saying that it has an asynchronous continua continuation. What that means is that the service task is not um, executed um, synchronously right away when the um, um, user tasks are completed, but um, um, the process engine creates a safe point and then continues asynchronously. So those are triggers that um, um, 
need to be managed by the process engine. So the fact that we kick off a, a new instance every eight hours, the fact that we cancel user task after two hours, and also this behavior of continuing um, execution asynchronously in the process. And the job executor is the component um, of the process engine, which is able to manage those triggers. We call them jobs. And um, the job executor is then responsible for executing those jobs. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Um, there's, there's one more matter that I always like to bring up because it's so um, so real world. Um, I don't know. Maybe you mentioned that um, the matter about what happens if a service call fails. You know, let's let's assume we we're calling some some backend application that is just not um, available right now, or there's some some problems in the payload or whatever. And under those circumstances, and that can of course happen in the real world. Um, the job executor also takes care of the necessary tries, for instance, as as as. Uh, um, that's at least what, what I've understood from what you've explained me once. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's what it does. So if you um, have an asynchronous continuation like that, or also a timer, it's the same behavior. Then if execution fails, it can just retry. You can configure that. You can have things like um, um, increasing intervals of retries. And then at some point it gives up, and then it shows up in cockpit as an incident. And then you can... Uh, look, look into that problem so because apparently it wasn't able to consolidate on its own and then you can um, retry manually at some point but um, before the manual retry you have the automatic retries exactly yeah exactly and and, and this is actually um, a, a matter or a pattern that is um, kind of related or overlapping really with what you actually um, do with ESBs, for instance, as well. So there's yes. kind of an overlap. Um, and and the next question is, you know, but it's a fun thing because if you're not really, you know, technically into those those things, you don't really appreciate um, what what this really means. But I do remember that um, that that we have been improving that job executor almost every release since we started going our own way one and a half years ago. So. So um, it's, it is really important. We're not doing that just for fun, but because we have customers like, um, as I mentioned, like, like, like T-Mobile, like AT&T, so big customers from the telco industry. We have customers like Zalando who um, process all orders um, using Camunder. So those customers are, of course, driving as well um, um, our, our decisions regarding um, improvements, and a good part of them is about the job executor. So could you just um, say in a nutshell, what are the, um, 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 the highlights of this release regarding the job executor? Once again, <laughs> yeah, so in, in the context of 7.5, uh, sorry, 7.4 it is, uh, so what we've done is two things. Um, the first one is um, reducing contention, I'll explain what that means, and the second one is um, uh, prioritization. So what, 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 what's the thing about contention? So if you have multiple nodes running Kamunda, multiple instances of the process engine, and by that also multiple instances of the job executor, these individual instances will query the database um, and attempt to lock jobs in the database. And when you do that, um, then it can happen that many instances uh, or multiple instances of the job executor do that at the same time. And then um, when multiple writers ac um, access the same data source uh, concurrently at the same time, you get contention. And um, what we did in the 7.4 release is that we um, build in some capabilities that allow you to reduce contention by um, having a mechanism which is very simple, um, but also very effective, and that is exponential backoff. So um, what you try to do is um, once you um, determine that you have contention um, so that you were not able to um, acquire um, a set of jobs because some other node um, attempted to acquire the same jobs at the same time, you're not going to uh, try again um, immediately, but um, what it can now do is it can wait for a random period of time to um, uh, also um, reduce have similar behaviors so that when multiple nodes um, uh, just wait for the same time to try again. And that is very effective. So we have a blog post out about that and you can read the details in there. So that's one thing. Um, what well, it, it makes things faster. <laughs> Yeah, um, and and the other thing is um, sometimes you are not not fast enough, or there, there there is simply too much work to do. And when you run in those situations, just um, um, as in in real life, what you try to do is you try to focus on the things that are most important. And um, now users can specify priorities for 
um, at different levels. So first at a job, defin um, sorry, at a process definition level. So maybe um, processing inbound orders are more important than processing claims or whatever. So some processes are more important than others. Then um, at a um, um, activity level or sub-process level, so you can have some um, activities within a process um, that are more important than others. And you can also then do that um, at runtime and you can have this, um, certain process instances that are prioritized over others. And then you have this concept of the VIP customer who places an order and that order should be processed with higher priority. So um, yes, and, and that really comes in when you have more work to do that that you can do. Um, yes, so yeah, th that's basically what we did in, in, in the 7.4 version um, regarding the job executor. Super, super, thank you, Daniel. Yeah, it's really, for me, it's always, um, I mean, it's really just, just me, you know, being the CEO, not, not being competent enough to actually um, participate in, in, in coding the product. So I'm always very impressed by what, what you guys actually do. And um, I can only say, there's, there's um, a good bunch of, of, of people in our team um, who are very, very deep into those matters and, uh, and, and are continuously improving uh, the behavior of our process engine for those kind of situations. So um, complex processes, mission-critical processes, um, um, yeah, asynchronous continuation situations, um, which are also about um, recovery and, um, and, and retries, and all that um, in, in, in a context that is about um, yeah, huge amounts of, 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 of instances being processed um, on a single node in a cluster, etc. So that's why we're investing so much time and, um, and, and, and uh, talent in that. All right, cool. So yeah, thanks again. Um, let's, let's proceed. So um, there's, there's a few more um, things that we have done, especially in terms of improving our support for BPMN and CMN um, once again. One is the BPMN heat map, the other enterprise-only feature that I'm going to demonstrate in a few minutes. Um, but before that, let's um, discuss briefly the BPMN escalation event. So that has been um, um, a blind spot until now um, when it came to our BPMN coverage, one of the very, very few remaining, and uh, we have added that um, in 7.4. So maybe, Daniel, could you just explain um, in a nutshell, what that escalation event is all about, what it's good for, and why we should be excited is that, <laughs> that it's here now. Yes, yes so, so the escalation event, event, it's a little bit like an error event. Um, many people are familiar with the error event. So the error event, um, when you throw that, so you may have a throwing error event, when you throw that, then um, the um, token um, um, executing the error event error event is consumed and um, then the error is caught and that's, that's where the process then continues. Um, escalation is a little bit different and in a way it, it, it's more flexible. So it, it also allows you to signal some kind of um, um, interesting situation or um, exceptional situation you could also say, but um, it has two um, key differences and, and the first one is um, after throwing the escalation, you can continue in with the normal flow. So you can signal that there is this um, interesting situation that needs to be handled some, somehow, but then you can continue. Uh, so it does not, um, um, it's not an error where you, you, you cannot recover and, and need to stop there. Um, and um, the second one is you can also react to that um, um, escalation um, in the uh, handler, you can re react to it in a way that, that uh, is non-interrupting. So um, uh, you can inter um, react to it asynchronously in the sense that, um, well, while um, the, um, well, let's call it main part of the process that through the escalation event can continue um, concurrently to that, you can uh, then escalate and process some escalation logic. Um, then, um, similar also to an error, you can throw it across call activity, um, hierarchies, boundaries, whatever you want to call it. So one sub-process instance deep down in the hierarchy can raise that escalation event um, and it can then be handled um, further up in the hierarchy by um, the um, process that in invoked that sub-process instance. So th that makes it very flexible and very powerful and I'm excited that, that we now have it um, in, in the platform. Yeah, okay, cool. Thanks. And, and I'm actually as well. So, um, yeah, it's always, you know, it's always hard um, or maybe dangerous to claim that, but I think that Commander, um has 
probably at least one of the um, most complete um, coverages of, of the BPMN standard in, um, in the market. Um, so we've not only um, added the, the escalation event, now we have also um, extended support for the BPMN signal event as well as the compensation event um, and also improved um, what you can do in CMN. So we have implemented the newest version of the CMN standard, um, also adding the so-called CMN repetition rule. But we have also added... Um, where is it here? Um, the, op the possibility to actually trigger a DMN decision from a CMMN um, decision task. So a new task type similar to the business rule task um, type in BPMN that allows you to invoke decisions from a case handled by the CMMN standard. Um, yeah, calling um, um, DMN decisions from BPMN is something that I've already covered and already shown. And you can also um, call uh, or instantiate CMN cases directly from BPMN now using call activities. All right. So um, besides that, there's not so much left to tell and show, but one thing that I am particularly fond of, or fond of is um, the so-called BPMN heat map. So let's quickly have a look at that. Um, and that's actually a thing that um, yeah, was initially triggered by someone from our open source community. So someone implemented a um, plugin for cockpit in a yeah, kind of prototypical um, way that was about displaying a heat map. And we were very impressed by that and inspired. So we re-implemented that completely from scratch in order to yeah, make it um, totally stable, etc. So now you can find it in cockpit. And... Let's look, for instance, at, at the dish thing, okay? So when I'm looking at the dish process right now, um, there's, there's currently uh, one instance um, that has been executed um, in this version so far, and um, that's currently pending down here. So let's quickly complete that instance. Um, did a little lip. Okay, let's just quickly uh, start two more instances. Let's say um, it's not so much about roast beef now, so it's winter, and we have 10 guests. Okay, so this is about stew, and um, maybe, I don't know, let's say it's fall, and we have only one guest. So we will serve spare ribs. I love spirits. Okay, um, so let's look at what has happened so far. Uh, we have the dish process that has been executed about um, three times altogether, mostly um, in the upper branch. Um, uh, fewer executions, namely one, um, went, went down um, the lower part. And when we look at the heat map, we can see that right away. So um, this, is, this is the view that helps us to see at one glance um, what is actually going on in our process. And this is, of course, especially helpful um, when we have very complex BPMN diagrams and we want to see um, yeah, uh, very quickly which parts of the process um, we should be looking at in terms of um, yeah, potential bottlenecks, um, um, improvement potentials, optimization potentials, things like that. So that's why the heat map is a very nice thing, and um, yeah, it's, it's one of the things that we are um, that we are working on in terms of improving what you can do with Camunda in the ways of uh, business activity monitoring and yeah, analytics in general. Okay, so that's the heat map. Nice. Good. So what's left? Um, as you may have noticed, there's a completely new documentation now, um, docs.camunda.org, um, which is um, yeah, not just nicer to look at, but also um, has better usability. It's, it's um, easier to, to search it. So um, that's certainly a major improvement. Um, there's a new concept called external tasks um, that we won't cover in detail here, but you can look it up on the blog. Um, it's basically about um, yeah, making it possible to, um, to, to externalize um, the responsibility for, for um, completing tasks that have been triggered by a service task in BPMN. So normally, you know, it's a push thing. So um, the engine would call an external service. Um, the external task pattern allows us to um, um, let the services actually pull the work from the process engine and, and complete it. This has a number of, of advantages, one of them being the fact that it's easier to um, use Camunda BPM um, in non-Java environments. So if you're a .NET shop or um, whatever kind of, of shop technically, now it's, it's, it's once again easier to actually um, combine your existing um, um, and software artifacts with Camunda BPM. That's what external tasks are interesting about, um, or why they're interesting. We have a new cockpit plugin, which is about um, current deployments, allowing you to, for instance, redeploy or delete deployments. Um, you can also now um, 
one come on site uh, Tomcat 8, including all application server integrations. And there's also, um, this is Daniel's favorite new feature, <laughs> as he told me over beer runs, um, we have an improved support for handling files now in the API and the HTML forms. Um, Daniel, this is, this is really awesome, isn't it? Yeah, and it's the best. <laughs> All right. Yeah. No, it's it's really it's really good. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um. Yeah. So um, that's about it right now. Um. So what what could you do um if you want to to try Camunda BPM yourself? So what's what's there? What is available? And um, one thing that that you may um, um um wonder is what's actually the difference between the um the open source edition that is obviously free of charge and um, the enterprise subscription um, that you can purchase from us. So so feature wise, actually by purpose, it's not a huge difference. So um, the engine and and the modeler and the task list, or all those applications are available open source as well. Um, the only differences are um, if you actually want to use Camunda in yeah, more mission-critical, more enterprise-wide um, situations, we would recommend to um, benefit from the advanced cockpit features that we provide, for example, the BPM and heat map, but also the live editing of um, um, decision tables. Um, in general, looking at the history of, of BPM and processes, those are things that we provide for, for enterprise edition customers only. And also, if you want to run Camunda inside a web application server or or WebLogic, um, there are out-of-the-box distributions that make life easier that are available for enterprise edition customers. However, the main motivation is probably um, the support um, that, is, that is based on service level agreements, um, as well as um, the, the maintenance um, services. So we provide bug fixes um, in, the, in the way of patch releases very quickly as soon as, as we spot a bug or you report one. And of course, there's also consulting and training services being available on site in North America or, or wherever else you are located, as well as remotely. So, um, yeah. I mean, it's not not really, you know, special what, um, uh, what what we offer here in terms of differences. However, it makes a lot of sense, of course, um, if you want to go, let's say, if you want to go pro with Camunda. Okay, um, good. What else can you do? You can actually um, talk to us. So um, this is a very typical process um, that we have won um, a lot of times when, when customers or potential customers were interested in Camunda. So the, worst, the first step that makes a lot of sense is just a quick call. Let's just um, chat on the phone about your situation and figure out whether Camunda could actually be a good fit, what you would actually get from us as a vendor in terms of services, in terms of features, etc. And we can also already tell you about our pricing model, how much it costs, etc. So we're quite transparent here. Um, if, if that is um, promising for you, then it makes a lot of sense, not always, but quite often, to have an online meeting with, um, with one of our consultants. And so there you can have a, a um, yeah, deep discussion about, for instance, technical architectures, if you have um, certain things that you would like to, to clarify, like um, how you can run Camunda in your cluster environment, things like that. This is the place where you can ask all those questions. Of course, um, this, is, this is also free of charge, and you can actually yeah, get a profound um, impression and idea about whether Camunda could be the right technology. Um, if you actually want to um, evaluate Camunda in a, in a very profound way, then we, we can assist you there as well. So we can, of course, provide um, a free trial of, of the Camunda Enterprise Edition for download. We can assist you in your proof of concept. That's a very common thing that we do, let it be um, with on-site workshops or remote consulting. We can um, provide you temporary access to our product support, so you can ask our developers right away. And um, we can also be in touch with reference customers. So most of our customers, uh, for instance, like iTrade Network here um, from California, are available. Um, and if you want to talk to them about their experiences with Camunda, um, um, let us know, of course, then we bring you in touch. We don't want to bother them too much by sharing the contact data with anyone, but um, we're happy to bring you in touch. And um, that's also very helpful, um, um, as I can say, um, from our experience. Okay. Great. So, yeah. Um, that's about it for now. So um, thanks a lot for your interest and your time. Um, I think, Daniel and Nico, you have already answered um, um, some questions. So I don't know if there's anything left right now. We don't have any open questions. So if there is any question from the audience, feel free to um, ask them now. All right, there's an interesting question coming in regarding the modeler, can the modeler be used for CMMN? Um, 
Daniel just pasted the link in the chat. So the modeler cannot be used for CMN MN yet. It is something that is on our roadmap and you can expect something soon. We already soon means like in the next year, probably um, we ex like we already have a running viewer. So that's the stuff you can already expect. It will also be part of the BPM NIO with all the toolkits and all the documentation. And then it will also be part of the Camona modeler as soon as we have it implemented. The question is, will the recording be available online? Yes, the recording will be available online. We'll send the email around via the, like, because you guys were um, registering over the meeting at uh, network Camunda or you will receive an email with a link to the recordings. That might take some time, like a few hours or one day or something. Any more questions? Yeah, I think I think I've I've spotted something. Um, okay, someone is asking about um, how you can actually. You know, we already have a business rule engine in place. So, how does Camunda position themselves towards it? Should we use them both in parallel, or is one substituting the other? So that's a very good question. And um, it really depends, as always. So, um, yes, of course, Camunda is meant to be um, um, an engine now that can also execute um, decision tables. So if you are using an existing rule engine for doing just that and you're not happy with it, then you should seriously consider replacing it with Camunda. Why not? Of course. However, there's other aspects um, of business rule management that Camunda does not take care, take care of by purpose. So Camunda is not about, for instance, decision trees. It's not about, you know, very complex business rule management system capabilities um, um, with, I don't know, a, a, a huge um, repository for business users, stuff like that. So um, it's really pretty meant to, to stay lean um, and lightweight. So um, it's still under three megabytes and we want to keep it that way. So um, that's why it really depends on which system you actually use and of course, what you actually use the system for. There's also another interesting aspect on this, which is if you want to have traceability regarding the like decision taken, right? So Camunda using our really like simple and lean approach we are able to provide the traceability out of the box, like, like we have this process execution and uh, case execution. Users are also like, you can look inside the engine and have the history of like, which rules have actually been like, have activated by which reasons. So if you want to have that, it might get a bit more complicated to actually inter integrate external solutions, but like every good decision uh, engine or business rule engine has something like that as well. Um, oh, okay, there's, there's two more questions that I'm confident that I'm able to answer them. So the first one is very simple. Can we have a copy of the slides? Um, yes. So um, there will be a follow-up email, as, as Nico mentioned, and that email will um, point you to, um, to, to, the, to the network landing page and where, where you have signed up for the webinar, and they will find the link to the recording as well as to SlideShare, where you can find the slides as well. The second question is... Um, it's about, about um, DMN, which is more than just a table. So um, I, I will just answer it, and Nico, if you have anything to add, then just, just do it. So it's true, in DMN there's more than just tables. There's also, for instance, so-called decision requirements diagrams, DRD. And um, those are about how you can actually combine tables, etc. And I, um, I think that that makes a lot of sense. So the reason why we have not yet implemented is that we have um, focused on the very minimal core and actually the most also important and most valuable part of the standard, which are the decision tables. So in other words, decision tables without DRDs do make sense and have a value. Um, DRDs without decision tables don't have a value at all, obviously. So um, long story short, you can already um, um, use what's there in DMN and get a lot of value out of it. However, if you tell us that you really want the DRDs, the decision requirements diagrams, um, if you tell us in the forum, if you tell us you know, when we're in a sales situation, of course we will consider it. We are considering it already. However, um, we're prioritizing items on our roadmap based on real needs and, and, and inquiries. That's my answer, Nico. I don't know what do you think? 
Yes, the decision. The DMN is actually a really new standard and also like DMN 1.1, which is basically like the first version of the standard that is actually executable um, and also actually like, re like uh, there's actually like, it contains DI, which makes it also like drawable in dra diagrams. So um, it's a really new standard. And what we're trying to do right now, we're trying to build the, like as Jacob said, like the, the, tool support for the areas where we see the, the most value at the moment already. So if you guys have any input on this, um, if you can convince us, or if, if you're like, just indicate that you are in need of the other, of the other things, um, approach us in the forums, approach us via, uh, directly via Camunda and, um, that will definitely like get on the roadmap if there's a requirement. Ah, okay, that's, that's another question. I like that one. So actually, there's two. One is not a question, but um, an appreciation. And so someone from Spain um, says, thank you for the webinar and all your work on the product, etc. And um, yeah, th thanks. Uh, back to you. That's, that's also nice. You know? so it's very really nice to just learn that you like what we do. So um, <laughs> feel free to praise us whenever you like. It helps our ego. Um, no, and, and uh, we're really thankful for that as well. Um, so um, regarding that, that second question, does it make sense to connect several tables using DPMN to create decision flows? Um, this is, of course, a matter of, 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 of best practice. So um, um, I personally say, um, yes, it makes sense, and we have seen that in practice already. My co-founder, Bernd, has actually, I think, already blocked about it. So um, Bernd has, uh, is already helping a good number of customers ramping up with DMN as well as our other consultants. So um, um, combining, you know, uh, for instance, business rule tasks in order to create a decision flow um, can make a lot of sense depending on the circumstances, of course. There's always um, arguments against it, but, but basically, um, um, yes, it is a valid pattern, of course. Okay, great. So there's, there's even more uh, appreciation and praises now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, that, that's the point where we need to break it off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Isn't it? Okay. When audience went out of questions, right? All right. But I think, I think we're good. We're, we're um, just in time, so we, we have um, covered all that we wanted to cover. Um, um, thank you very much for your time, interest, and um, yeah, that you actually like working with Camunda. And maybe we're going to uh, meet each other one day. It would be, would be also great. And thanks to, to Daniel and Nico, of course, for, um, for helping me here. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.